All right, today what I'm gonna do is show how I do a painting of a la prima red roses. I like to do a la prima paintings often in my studio. Um, what it does is it kind of pushes me to, uh, you know, be a little bit more bolder. Uh, we used to do one day a la prima paintings in the atelier when I was studying there. And um, it's just a great way to just to see where you're at, see if you can kind of put everything together at the same time. What I'm doing here is working on just white canvas. There's no tone on it. And at the beginning here, I'm just grabbing burnt umber, um, no medium or anything. The brush I'm using is an opal brush from Trakel Art Supplies. I believe it's a number four, number six, and it's a long flat, or, a, or it could be a bright flat. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is just mass in, get the feeling of the contour, of the mass of the shape of the um, of the flowers and the vase that it's sitting in. So what I'm uh, what I'm doing is really just taking and blocking that in at the beginning. Once I get that general shape in, what I try to do is, and that's what I'm doing here, grabbing paint, loosening up just a tiny bit, and then I'm just massing in where I see some of that color. And you know this is the the mass of um, of the the roses uh, as you can see, and it's just taking and kind of placing them in there. Here I see a, just a tiny bit of like a dark note. Um, you, I'm always thinking about hierarchy too, so you can see that there's a, a slight hierarchy between each rose. They're not all the same uh, red or redness, uh, so just adding a tiny bit to it. Now I'm going to grab and mix uh, color just for the leaves. So just again, a tiny bit of Gansol in there and just seeing what those relationships look like next to each other, the same way in which I uh, visually see them on the painting. It, it's good to kind of work this way too. This is very much like how Harold Speed would say uh, to, to work and very much how uh, someone like Max Ginsburg would work. You're just getting the general mass, the shape, placing it on the canvas, and then massing in each shape uh, just with a flat flat color, right? Now I use Gamsol at the beginning because what it's gonna do is get the paint to be a little bit more lean. Um, and it also makes it so I can kind of push it. So I didn't use uh, a, any tone on the canvas. I'm using white, um, very much a, a impressionist way to work. When you do that, you can pick up, you're really picking up the undertones of the color. And the undertone could have a different color than a mass tone, so I'm not really going thick right now, I'm going really thin. And that thinness, instead of kind of subtracting color out, if I had, let's say, a gray neutral number five or something like that, which I often paint on, I have white underneath, so instead of um, the paint, the light going through the paint film and then going into uh, the ground and then subtracting uh, or absorbing in a sense into the, the ground color. I'm actually um, using it as a way to kind of brighten it similar to the way in which almost like a monitor would be and that's it's really like a, a lot of landscape painters which is why a lot of the um, the impressionists were almost all landscape painters they would do it because you can kind of get a richness almost like a light source from the back uh, of of uh, your painting so you can see I'm now getting a little bit of variety in there uh, you know I'm using a very limited palette on the top that's titanium white and we have cadmium lemon uh, next is yellow ochre cad red light uh, alizarin claret I don't use alizarin crimson because it has light fastness issues then burnt umber, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, and viridian. It's a pretty good palette. It's a sometimes referred to as a split uh, complementary palette, um, depending, of course, what wheel. This is referring, of course, to a uh, traditional color wheel. It's not going to get the full gamut of color. If I wanted to get the full gamut of color, I'd have to add just a few more colors. After that, that's where I'm grabbing. You can see that mixture right there that I'm adding is actually ultramarine blue with a little bit of a burnt umber and those two colors together um, really neutralize the mixture now I don't 
I'm not a big fan of grabbing just a true neutral out of a tube and uh, and you know adding that to the painting. I like to mix it because depending on how much ultramarine blue and how much of that burnt umber that I'm adding to it is going to be how neutral the mixture is. And if I'm if I want to be playful with the color, I can have a, a movement in that. Um, and that gray, I can make it go warm or cool in a sense. That's where I'm gonna add a little bit more ultramarine to make it a little bit cooler. I'm gonna add a little bit more burn umber to make it a little bit more warmer, and so on and so forth. And you can see that there's just a beautiful variety even in just having those two colors because I can also add the color in mass tone or undertone. Undertone means that I'm taking it and I'm adding the solvent to it or just scrubbing it into the surface and again uh, on white you're going to get a different perceived color uh, than if you were to just kind of cake it on with a palette knife or something and that kind of palette knife idea would be what's referred to as mass tone so again trying to move through the painting get some of these relationships i knew that i wanted to get the gray in there um, in the background and gray is a good color, grayish uh, in the background because it's going to, you know, help to um, accentuate the colors so that I'm not competing with the red or the green. Uh, black or gray would be good colors to kind of help uh, accentuate a color. White in the background would feel contemporary, but it may, um, you know, make the uh, pull away from it because um, you'd you'd be basically changing um, the contrast of the colors. So you can see the mo the drawing is really moving here too. You know, uh, the vase is moving. I'm really just kind of uh, scrubbing it in as, as big tones. This is where I'm starting to put in that shadow. And just think of the shape of that shadow and how it interlocks with the, um, with the green leaf there. So everything is about fitting these shapes together very much like the yin and the yang in a sense you know you're or no tan uh, Japanese uh, for I think light shadow and really it's just a, a a way of kind of having fun with the painting I don't want to think I'm painting flowers I don't want to think I know what a vase looks like yet this is a purely visual experience where you're getting everything to kind of relate uh, to each other uh, broadly in a picture um, you know, I think where sometimes uh, students get a little lost here is if they put way too much paint down. So using um, some kind of a medium, uh, you know, I use, uh, I use Gamsol to cut the oil so that there's a, a leaner mixture of oil. Um, just helps it so it can kind of like push around. Uh, and it feels more like, you know, uh, almost like what a carpenter would say measure twice cut once kind of idea that's viridian uh, i love viridian viridian's a blue green um and i'm just using that as a way to kind of get the darker part of um of the green uh you know most of the most of the green leaves in light are going to feel a little bit more towards the uh, yellow green side so um i'm making some dark marks i'm kind of leaving little notes trying to get the general big picture here and here's the cast shadow uh, going there um, you and also the the um, shears so the shears were added as kind of a an idea that I was kind of maybe painting uh, more of a verb uh, than a noun uh, it's not just flowers it's flowers with an action that's um, that's just been um, you know started uh, or completed uh, it's cutting the roses and and now you see them around there so anyway you can see I I did a little bit of measuring and if you've noticed I haven't done really any measuring at all I do a tiny bit um, at, at, at the beginning of this uh, the thing is if you get really good at um, painting shapes that's when you can get really good at um, seeing shapes and the interaction, how they interlock with one another. And it's a good exercise because you keep doing that, you work on that, and you'll realize that you don't have to measure all the time. Measuring can feel quite scientific and you know pull us away from the emotional side of painting and mark making. And I'm always trying to balance those two. I do want to measure as I 
say to all my students, you know, the caliper should be in the eyes, not in the hand. Um, to a degree, you want to have measured enough so that you get the general uh, of learning how to kind of use your eyes to go up and down and, and kind of see the relationships together. But I don't want to measure everything all the time. I don't find that to be all that um, pleasant of an experience. Uh, but I will do it, and I'll do it if I have to figure something out. Here you can see I'm just grabbing whatever's on the palette. It's not so much burn umber, but I'm trying to get that white cloth in there just to get the full relationship of the picture. Again, at the beginning like this, you know, it's better to kind of get the relationships and see what fits compositionally rather than try to fight it. And, um, and then, you know, if I have something too big, I'll have to move everything. You'd be fighting to keep your old drawing that you spent so much time on um, the the least attached the least amount of attachment you have to the painting um, you know the better so there's that those beautiful you know stems in the in the um, in the water and I'm trying to just kind of get a general mass them in but also look for a couple specific points you know sometimes um, massing in feels like you know too broad and you may want to grab like one or two small little things It'll just help to, um, you know, almost like anchors. Uh, you can always come back to that kind of anchor point if it was in the right spot. Um, so yeah, you know, generally getting the big picture here. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, once, it depends on where you are with the painting and how good it's gonna feel. Uh, it, you can, in an a la prima like this, you can kind of go for it whenever you feel good. like. The composition's pretty much worked out here. Uh, and that leaf down there has a nice light and shadow. So I'm, I'm kind of going for it down there. And the amount of paint I'm probably gonna add to that is probably very minimum, um, where a lot of the underpainting holds a majority of the form. And then after that, uh, I'm gonna, you know, go back and forth with it. So again, getting massing in, seeing that nice dark shape right there, uh, Sometimes what I'll even do, you know, if to get a highlight, this is a tough thing about working with um, a white canvas. To get a highlight uh, to sit in, in a painting, you don't want to put white on white because you wouldn't see anything. So sometimes what I'll do is just, and you can see I did it right next to the shears on the right of that between the shears and the um, petal. Uh, just put a little bit of a wash and let it just set, let it dry a little bit. You know, burn umber would be a good color for that because iron oxides dry rather fast or oxidize and therefore you could put that down and come back after and then I'm gonna do that you'll you'll see um, to add the white cloth as uh, as a textural element over the top to have a little bit of color kind of peeking through so anyway you can, you can kind of see just the shapes and and really getting good at painting shapes and the interaction of of how they come together it's purely optical experience the, the conceptual model for this is going to be that, you know, there's not a lot of conceptual things in here. Of course, I can bring a conceptual model of how to paint roses uh, and diffuse transmission or some something that would relate to, you know, what I know about it. And that's what the uh, conceptual model would be. But the optical model is, a, is really kind of that value relationship that we see up in front of us. And you can actually get good at doing either of the two. You can paint with both or you can paint with one. I know plenty of artists that um, do one over the other. I think Max is a bit more on the optical side uh, where conceptual model is more, um, you know, studying the construction of things and uh, understanding that a vase has symmetry, things like that, perspective. Uh, you know, on a flower there's not all that much of that. The only thing that's going to really have it here is the vase and then if I know perspective that's going to help me out when I'm doing the um, cloth as well. So you can see just rendering a piece there uh, to really get that kind of softness uh, to the to the um, the leaf uh, and you can see you know I don't really have I can either uh, tip it really dark and like I can grab green. I don't have a lot of options here for my palette, right? So I can grab Viridian, which is a dark blue green, or I can grab ultramarine blue, and that's gonna tip it even more blue, right? 
So one is gentle and the other one's a little bit more harsher, but they're both beautiful and having those two in the picture will 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 give a little bit of a to me a richness. Uh, here I'm trying to create a gray again. So you can see that that's that's kind of like my spot on the palette for that gray mixture uh, to put it right up over there. You can see that mixture right there is a little bit too much on the blue side. I'm just going to grab a little bit more burn umber um, and just try to get back to kind of where I was before. And you can see that's a little bit darker. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to put a little test swatch down and then come back to it. But pushing that paint around, massing it in, again, you know, the more of the picture that you can get down in terms of masses, this is why all the Prima painters do this, you'll see the whole picture come together. Um, you know, the, the alternate way, the way I kind of was taught for like form painting was to, you know, paint like one form at a time. Um, and each one of them has a pro and a con to it because this is a very, this can get rather, this could go sideways. <laughs> quickly if I don't um, if I don't know what I'm doing and that's why you want to do these all the time really get in the mode of trying to just figure out how to do this uh, and do it well and the other thing about this too is that it, it lends itself to um, you know how much do I need to make the picture it's just like a poster study in my opinion and poster studies are small little uh, versions of the painting Anyway, back to the form idea. The form idea is really kind of like getting on the form and rendering almost like the crap out of that one form. It's what the window shading technique is. Much different than this Harold Speed. Uh, Harold Speed talks about it, but uh, the French Academy talked about it too in their in their books, which is to mass in the form, uh, get the general. Uh, so work from general to specific. And again, I think both of those have fantastic results and uh, sometimes you just don't know what your paint you want your paintings to look like you're trying to figure out what the you know you know the fundamentals you get them and now we're trying to take it and put it all together and the best way to do that is to work it out on a painting and sometimes it takes a bunch of paintings to work all that stuff out it doesn't just happen overnight or even if you understand it it doesn't mean that your paintings will look like what you want them to or that you can uh, you can really hit hit where you're looking to hit so you can see always about drawing drawing is the most important part of any painting just like value is too uh, I probably sound like a broken record saying that but really I'm trying to um, get all the relationships with understanding of drawing if if you get really good at drawing uh, color will come like you, you almost can't not get color color is guided by value and drawing so get good at those two things, master them. Uh, if it means that you have to do some color studies or value studies or, or just draw every day, do it. Don't let it um, bother you in your, in your work. So now going for like a little corner, you know, a little sweet spot of the painting and there's a, a beautiful transparency uh, to that paint. This is um, Alizarin Claret. Lizard Claret is uh, PR177. It's an anthraquinone color. It is um, it's very similar to alizarin crimson. It's sometimes referred to as uh, permanent alizarin. And uh, I'm just trying to, you know, get it in there in terms of, uh, you know, like the transparency of a darker red to go over that cad red light that I put down first. And you can see I'm pushing the drawing so I'm drawing as I'm painting so those general shapes that all relate to one another are still going to be refined uh, but I'm also thinking about the transparency of the paint and the delicateness of the, these roses you know I can't I don't really want to just paint them as you know op opaque you want to it's almost like you don't have to but I try to think of the the paint as an extension of the way in which the the the, the delicacy of the uh, object is too. So something more rigid may have a little bit more texture and these uh, should have like a beautiful transparency to them. To get darker, I don't have anything that's darker so I would I, I am doing it here. I'm, I'm having to push the dark 
color of the rose uh, to um, ultramarine blue and um, you know that's the beauty sometimes of having just a limited palette it forces you to uh, work with what you got you know I could have sometimes my my extended palette has I think 24 colors or 26 uh, but sometimes it's nice to just see you know if you play piano uh, you know what would happen if you played like a, a small piano or something like that you know the, the range would be a little bit different but you could still make beautiful music so similarly that's what I'm thinking about with a limited palette here so I, I'm really looking for kind of like the drawing right now but then also some of those dark moments that really help to kind of make that the composition and and the picture kind of turn the corner uh, so you can see uh, it, it's it's feeling pretty good at this point uh, but I do want to get even more I always draw through just to make sure that that line is like one of the number one things I critique uh, and you can just even paint it right through if you need all the way to the other side uh, I usually just kind of go over the top and ghost it I'm not touching the surface through the vase uh, but I want to get some of that shadow in there too and that's you know that's important because it's it's a uh, it's going to set up that whole kind of key over there. Um, you know, it, it, think about it like portraits. Portraits, a lot of people start out like the eyes, and then they'll work towards um, work towards the, the, you know, moving around to the nose and the eyebrow and the hair and all that stuff. So really what I'm looking to do here is just get the value in the right spot. You can see I fixed the, the shape of that, um, of that uh, leaf. And I'm using that right there, the things around it to triangulate, just to make sure that, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. This is where things just have to relate to one another and be pretty close. Uh, but putting that shadow in and trying to study just the shape of it, uh, obviously it's soft, it's a cast shadow, but there's, I think it's a penumbral shadow because I, I, I remember I had a couple lights going on in the studio. It wasn't directly like one light. But look at the beauty of that that warmth there, right? So it, it kind of has a warm, cool contrast in the shadow, but I think it feels like a little bit too light. So I'm going to just go in, and I think I eventually uh, make this darker. So once you get something in, it may change the perception of something else. Um, I noticed that the, you know, some of those dark, dark moments didn't feel as dark as they did before. So now I, I want to get them dark. Right? I want to uh, get that tiny uh, amount of change in there. Um, the beautiful thing too about a la prima uh, and, and doing it this way is that it celebrates the brush stroke. You know, you're, you're living with a mark and your confidence. That's why I think this is a very confident way of painting. Um, and I, that's why I think everybody should do it. Um, but, you know, putting that mark down and letting it live and then thinking about the language that you can get with your marks you know I'm gonna get a different mark uh, with this brush that I would get with something else but also the way in which I'm applying it I'm kind of working from a th from thin to thick uh, and and putting it on there but kind of pulling up off the brush see it kind of springs uh, that's the beauty of like an opal brush it's not quite a bristle it's not a soft nylon brush it's more of like somewhere in between the two so there's a little bit of springiness to the brush and you can see I'm pushing in and then kind of letting up off it um, I think of it almost like a clutch when you're when you're driving you know the, the clutch really helps to kind of spring you forward if you're trying to get in the in the right gear and um, you know that's what we're we're trying to get a pressure sensitivity similar to, to a stylus uh, and and that's really the extension of you uh, that's why I like digital painting to me even a stylus is just a pressure sensitivity of of uh, pushing or uh, you know just just that but the brush seems to be more of an extension where you're feeling it you know I'm, I'm feeling that move onto the surface and scrape paint over paint is a different feeling uh, than it would be you know paint over just canvas uh, the, the the weave of the canvas is also a big component of it as well